live from Facebook. All right, grace and peace, everybody. Grace and peace. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. Thank God for you. Uh, all those of you who are joining us tonight, blessings, blessings, blessings to you. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. I want you to come on in to the room and let's prepare for this great, great opportunity to have a conversation from the cross to have a conversation from the cross. I want you to come on and join us, all of our crown partners that are coming in the room. We want you to give us your name, let, let us know that you're here, and then give us some thumbs ups, hearts, likes and love, and then share us with your audience and your friends. So I need everybody to share, share it to your page, share it to um, what you're doing, share it to your friends, so that everybody know uh, that we're on. Come on, we're having conversations uh, from the cross conversations from the cross, all right? Uh, it is a great opportunity for us to come to you via this method. I know this is unconventional for us, but yet and still, it's the way we're moving now in this uh, time and this season of our life during the pandemic. Uh, we know that so much is going on in our world, but we are excited that we still have opportunity that we can come to you and we wanna welcome. We wanna welcome you into our conversation as you welcome us into your home. You welcome us where you are with your family and your friends or whomever you're quarantined with. Um, even if you're by yourself, you're not by yourself now. You got us with you. And we're here for a little while just to share with you, to encourage you, to pray for you, and to uplift you in the great things of God. God is still great. He's still greatly to be praised. He's still worthy of the honor. He's still worthy of the glory. And we're excited for this moment to come and share with you in this precious hour. So come on in. Come on in. I need to see some thumbs ups and hearts. I need to see some likes and loves. I need to see all of that happening. I want y'all to comment. Grace and peace to all of our crown partners. Grace and peace to you. And we want to certainly come in to uh, uh, share with you. We want to come in and minister to you. We want to give you a word from the Lord. And so it's important that you come in and join us now. That's it. I see those hearts. I see those thumbs ups. That's it. You guys are phenomenal. Thank you so very much. Uh, thank God for technology <laughs> that we could come uh, again this way to come to you and to share with you. We have some great gifts who are going to be sharing with us tonight. I'm excited for each of them. I'm excited of what they have to contribute uh, with us and to us. Uh, it's going to be a fabulous time. We're not going to hold you all night, but we certainly want to encourage you and we want to thank God for you. All right. So again, while you're liking and loving and share. Everybody share, 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 share. It's going to be real good. And we want as many people to hear this great message. I want you to go with us to, in prayer as we prepare this time and this moment. Let's pray before the Lord as he, and invite him in as he ministers to us as we minister to you. Father, we thank you. Oh, great God you are for this day that you've made. We rejoice and we're glad in this opportunity to share your word, to share your heart, to share your mind with your people. Father, we are now just like it was that first Easter. We're now just like it was that first Good Friday. We're in our homes. We're behind our closed doors. So Father, we thank you that even now that the spirit of that hour, the spirit of that time would come right here in these rooms. Go right there in the living rooms and bedrooms. Go right there, Father, where they're listening and where they're chiming in. I pray, oh God, that you would minister to us and that you would cause the price that Jesus paid for us at Calvary to be preeminent, to be the focal point, to be what we concentrate upon. So many things are going on in our world, oh God. You already know coronavirus has hit the entire world. We're in the middle of a pandemic, but oh great God that you are, we still look unto you as the author and the finisher of our faith. We yet give you praise and glory and honor. We lift you up and magnify your name. We adore you. We bless you. Hallelujah. And we praise you with our whole heart. In spirit and in truth, we worship you. Oh Father, so have your way and move by your spirit in this moment. Move by your spirit in this hour. Comfort us and keep us as we further go upon thee and with you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen 
and amen. Thank you again, you all, for joining us tonight. It is so great to see many of you chiming in, logging on. Hello to all of you. Grace and peace to all of you. Thank God for you, and we pray that the Lord blesses you real, real good. I want you uh, to just introduce to you for a moment all of our uh, panelists and our conversationalists that are here in our room. Uh, all of us are sons and daughters of Crown Ministries, and we're certainly appreciative that we at Crown Ministries, the Royal Worship Center, have something to offer you and share with you today on this Good Friday. It is a Good Friday, and we want to share with you. So we want to introduce those who are here with us. We want to uh, welcome and thank God for uh, none other than Elder Dale Olatokin. He's here with us tonight. Uh, Elder Dale Day is waving hand. Thank you for joining us tonight. We also have with us our prophetess Jennifer Mowbray. She's here with us tonight. Amen. She's there waving her hand. Uh, we also have with us, he's serving a dual role tonight. He's going to be our administrator as well is our conversationalist. Let's welcome Brother Justin Parr. He's with us as well. Thank you so kindly. As well, we have with us uh, that great thinker and uh, the podcaster. Minister Tyreek Lang is with us. We, he's joining us tonight. So very grateful to have him with us, as well as we thank God all the way. We crossing uh, state border lines. Y'all see how this technology allows us to do this? We're not just in New York. We're also in Houston, Texas. Tonight, joining us from Houston, Pastor Chanel Ramsey. We welcome her tonight. And then cross the state line again, going all the way down to that Queen City, Charlotte, North Carolina. Pastor Shante Smith is with us as well. Thank God for all of you. I appreciate you. I honor you uh, for being here tonight, and I welcome you. And those of you who are watching us on Facebook Live, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for joining us to have this conversation. I want, I want to jump right into this because I think that the hour, the time that we're in right now, it makes us, it demands us to focus. You know, uh, I, I believe that the Lord just, he, he does things and he does all things well, but he'll get your attention one way or another. And I think all of us, as busy as we are, as much, as many things we have in life to do, he's making us pay attention. What just in this time of being quarantined, dealing with the pandemic, what does it do for you when it deal, when deals with the cross? looking at the cross and the quarantine how does that work together for you how is that making you focus differently right now somebody just give me uh, 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 some points of how you're being made to focus right now come on pastor Tate, give me some <coughs> oh hello everybody good evening um so <laughs> I jokingly said to my friends that I have been working from home for the past three years, so it feels like my life has been in quarantine. Um, but during this pandemic, um, since it started uh, mid-March, I really have been taking the time to really seize the moment. I believe that in the midst of all of the chaos, in the midst of all of the clamor, of course, there are detrimental things that are happening. But as a believer, I'm pressing my ear close to God because I'm saying there's something that you want me to prepare for. There's a place that you need me to get to. And there is something that you need to give to me because after the dust settles, I really believe that there's going to be an emergence of new voices that the church of the living God is going to stand and rise like never before. So Bishop, through entrepreneurship and ministry, I've just been getting myself ready. Mm, wow. Getting yourself ready. Yeah, what, what, what is it for you, Minister Lane? What, what does this say to you, this time of quarantine and just focusing on the cross? How does it help you focus on that? Uh, thank you, Bishop. Um, hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here um, tonight. Uh, I would say that it's given me a lot of time to reflect. And so as the, the more I've got to look through, like just the scriptures and we've done some research for tonight, the time of reflection has been amazing, right? And where you can really think about the suffering that Christ went through, especially with all of the losses that we've been experiencing recently, is it, it really makes you think of, of Christ, right? It makes you think of, of your salvation. It makes you think of what he did. It makes, it makes you think of what he went through to die. And so watching things that a lot of people are going through, a lot of close friends have lost relatives and fathers and, and mothers and close family members, 
um, as well as uh, people just from, from afar. You've, you've watched the how Christ has been a centerpiece of holding wow. people, right? So uh, like that, that, that scripture that says, may we receive a peace that surpasses all understanding. Um, that when you look at how Christ went to the cross, there was a level of peace that he had in the sense of knowing that the Father's will was going to be fulfilled, right? And so thinking about that and reflecting on that and having time to just center myself, center myself and focus on Christ has done nothing but just make me grateful that I have him. Mm, wow, that's good. That's good. Elder Dale, what, what, what does this time in the cross has to do? What does it say to you? Uh, it's been saying to me about it, it took for me it's more like um, with using a crucifixion that time of getting back to what was said right so we know Christ was on his way to the cross on his way to crucifixion but part of what kept him is what was said you know back in the beginning back in the garden right of what was to come you know what I'm saying because he had his moments where he was like I, I don't want to do this but because of right. what was said, I'm going to make this happen. So to me, it's, it, it, with everyone, is what was said to you, you know, whether it was a prophecy, whether it was a word from somebody, whether it was, whatever, what was, what was that thing that you had that your job was keeping you from or school was keeping you from wow. that now you have the time and you have the availability to do it? Because truth be told, most of our um, excuses is the lack of, abil uh, lack of availability. Yeah. So being that we're now quarantined, we have no choice. It's more like, look, you have no choice but to now reflect on what was told to you or what was said or what was prophesied to you and get back to connecting to that word. So I, for me, it's, it's, connect, it's connection through, through crucifixion, right? Wow. We're connecting, we're reconnecting to our original word, our original state of being by being quarantined because we have nothing else pulling at us. That's powerful. That's about connection through crucifixion. That's powerful. And I think it's something that we need to zero in on. And I want to jump right into uh, deeper into this conversation because this is what I often think. You know, we do seven last saying services every year. I mean, people have seven last saying services in February. I don't know what that's about, but they start in February. They have seven last saying service. I mean, and they last until the 4th of July. They just keep having them. And unfortunately, it's, it becomes... It becomes platform for a preach fest. It becomes opportunity for people to just, you know, show off their talents and their gifts, not really anointing. And I think that it often loses its purpose and its significance. I think we should celebrate it every year. I think we have seven last saying service every year. But I also think that the motive should motivate the message uh, and even the method so that we're not just doing it because it's Good Friday. But we're doing it because of the deep message that's involved. And here's, here's, in my opinion, what oftentimes get lost. What gets lost is the message of the cross. Yeah. The message of the cross often gets lost. And not only that, here's, here's, here's what I want to pull out tonight in this conversation. I want to pull out the reality of the moment. The realness. I think we all now can feel agony, anxiety, fear. We all feel that. I know they say, God the hand given us a spirit of fear, power, love, sound, like, whatever, okay? <laughs> we feel anxiety. We feel scared. We feel fearful. All of those emotions are coming to head. And I think it is giving us a, a, a microcosm perspective of what Jesus felt at that time. Yeah. And I think it's becoming really real for us. It's becoming very real. It's not just a story we hear once a year. It's not just something we see on television. You know, Mel Gibson did a fabulous job with the Passion of Christ movie, but we are now feeling it. And I want I want to go. I want to walk in there real quickly, and I want y'all guys to join me. Listen to this: Matthew twenty six and thirty six. Matthew twenty six and thirty six. It says, "Then come of Jesus with him unto a place called Gethsemane." And he said unto the disciples, sit ye here while I go to pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and they began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. And when he went a little further, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. 
Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt be done. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. And he said unto them, Peter, what could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Verse 42, and he went again the second time and he prayed, oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, then thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and said unto him, sleep on now, take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. Can you, can you, can y'all help me paint that picture of the moment of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? When it says right there in scripture that his soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. His soul is exceeding sorrowful, sorrowful even unto death. What do you imagine Jesus was going through? at that very moment. Pastor Chanel, I want you to chime in on this. What do you think, what would your imagination would say Jesus is feeling at this moment in Gethsemane? Okay, thank you so much for allowing me this space. I just want to start by saying thank you for having this conversation. It's so necessary in this time that we're in, this time of crisis, where we're, we're forced to look to the cross, right? We're in wow. crisis and we're forced to look to the cross. And um, not many pastors and bishops and leaders will platform millennial voices during this time. Uh, but I thank God that you are one of those leaders who are doing so. And so when we start looking at Christ in this moment. I, I just feel that um, what many people don't understand is that sometimes we look at the cup as he was, you know, he was battling with death. But I don't think it was that that was the fullness of it. I think it was loneliness. I think, you know, he's about to do something that nobody else can do right? Even if they wanted to do it, they couldn't do it for him. It was an assignment that only he could fulfill. Um, so the loneliness of walking that walk. And I know that many people in the body of Christ, they experience that loneliness as they embrace their call. Mm -hmm. And this was a moment which Christ was actually embracing his call. He had done the works, but now it was time to answer the call, that final call, that final push that was going to seal the deal. What many um, scholars believe the cup represented was the wrath of God, not death, but the wrath of God. He mm -hmm. was about to encounter and experience the wrath of God on our behalf. So yeah. not only is he doing this, but he's doing it for somebody else. This ain't even his cup. <laughs> this is not even his challenge. <laughs> and he's doing it for somebody else who he knows that everyone won't come back and say thank you. Everyone wow. won't come back and appreciate this sacrifice. So I think it's that feeling unappreciated. It's it's being faced with loneliness. And I think all those two things really can bring a lot of anxiety, especially for those of us who give our all to the call. Wow, that's powerful. <laughs> feeling the loneliness of the call. So Providence Morgan, what do you think then that he was feeling when you know, he asked these guys to come pray with me. They go to prayer and tarry service and they go to sleep in the middle of prayer and tarry service. What, tell, tell me about that. What's that feeling? I was just thinking about how, um, how, you know, you they say like the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I think that it's amazing to me that, you know, Jesus selected the people who were with him because these are people who were dear to him. And I think that those people agreed to follow him because they loved him. And at the same time, it's like Jesus was getting an opportunity to see the frailty of humanity because I feel like, um, just like many of us might feel this way, it's like our intention is to be passionate and persevering in prayer. And at the same time, when we're faced head on with a crisis, we end up doing what a lot of other people do. We might try to find a way to escape, right? You know, this is overwhelming. I don't know how to handle this. I'm gonna go to rest. Whereas I know that I should be in this, this position of, of praying and, and being supportive. And I think that for Christ, he knows that he's the only person that can fulfill this. But just 
being able to see firsthand how these people who he has been pouring into now for three years, who he knows loves him, how they're not even able to like persist in that moment of support with him. It's like a realization that I'm going to do this alone, right? I'm not going to be able to like count on my best friends right now to help me through this process. And I think even with what's going on right now in the world, it's really hard. Part of what's made this pandemic and this situation difficult is the idea of people having to go through the process all by themselves, which is very much not like human nature. So I just, when I look at that scripture, I see myself in those disciples that says like, wow, your, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. And how sometimes at the moment when you should show up, how you can end up not showing up and how the Lord didn't use that as a reason to back out of his original mission, he <laughs> understands that, you know what? I, I am strong enough to bear this cup. Let's go. The hour is now. We, we have to get this journey started. Right. That's, that's amazing. That's powerful because, I mean, there's some journeys we got to walk alone. And he, took, he didn't just take any disciples. He took his inner core. He took Peter, James, and John. So he took the three boys that, I mean, if anybody understands me, y'all saw me transfigure. Y'all saw me turn inside out on the Mount of Transfiguration. So if anybody gonna be praying with me, it's my boy, it's my girl, it's my ace bull, it's, you know, it's my boy, they, you gonna rock with me. But then when he finds them sleep, he, you know, he says, man, I mean, he almost gets aggravated and annoyed at them. But every time he goes back to pray, what blessed me so significantly was he prayed, even Jesus prayed the same prayer three times. Mm -hmm. How many times have we heard people say, well, if you pray for it, you don't have to pray for it again. You just believe in God and it's already done. Even Jesus prayed the same prayer three times. It speaks of the war. It speaks of that battle. It speaks, like we said, Pastor Chanel, that wrath. And it speaks of the loneliness that he was in. I can't pass this buck. How many times have we tried to pass the buck on somebody on and give the assignment to somebody else? But it's your assignment. You got to do it. You got to do this by yourself. But just to chime in on that real quickly, uh, what, what is doing it by yourself, doing it alone? What are your thoughts? Our Jump in, Bishop. Oh, go, 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 go. Yes, go ahead, Miss Elaine. Okay. I, I, you know, looking at the scripture is just fascinating, right? It's like thinking about, the, the control, thinking about the overall power, thinking about the authority that Christ had. What like you see as long as you the long as you go along the, the the crucifixion story, you see the Jewish establishment saying things like, if you are the son of God, save yourself, right? Take yourself down from here, speak up for yourself, do something. But here Jesus has resulted to prayer. He resulted to he knew what the outcome was going to be. He knew what the agony was going to be. He knew that that I'm not a martyr, you know, I'm not being killed. I'm laying down my life, right? And so even in that, you see the grace where we, we learned that this is the disciples falling asleep while Jesus was in prayer and agony is just indicative of, of where they're going to be where he, when he gets to the cross, absent. They're not there, right? And so you see that even as he tells Peter, he goes, you know, because the two disciples that sinned was Judas and Peter during the crucifixion story. And he tells them, you know, watch and pray that you may not fall into temptation. And the temptation that Peter fell into was to preserve his own self, preserve his life, to, to lie and say, I didn't know him. And so you see Jesus' grace, you see his love, you see his compassion in this moment that he continues to go back, right? And think about how often we fall asleep at the well. How does Jesus come back to us? Woo! How many times have we fallen asleep, but he comes back to us? Yeah. We have fallen asleep on our assignment. We've fallen asleep in prayer and fasting. We've fallen asleep with gifts, talents, and abilities. But he keeps coming back to us. My God, that's powerful. Come on, come on, uh, Brother Justin. What's, what, what do you guys say about all this? Um, first of all, I just want to say it's a super honor to be up here with all you uh, elders and pastors and ministers and, and prophetesses and, and all that other good stuff. <laughs> it's good to be here. Um, 
but I think um, in this moment, just just the I, I have to go back to what uh, Pastor Chanel was saying about how this is a moment of of loneliness. Um, if you go back to Matthew uh, chapter twenty. Um, and just looking at how the mother of James and John came to Jesus and asked, hey, when you get to heaven, you got to give my boys a seat at your left and your right. And he asked, he said, do, do you even know what you're asking? And I think the, the biggest struggle for Jesus throughout this entire time period is the fact that he's, it, it's, it's that he's 100% God, he's 100% man. So in his 100% man, he feels all the pain. He see, he feels all the agony. He sees the betrayal, the you know, the loss, and he feels all that. But in his 100% of God, he also sees everything that's about to happen. He sees mm -hmm. everything from beginning to end because he's outside of time. Um, so it, it's with that hypostatic un union that we really start to see. Now he's in a place where he knows what he's about to go through. And in his head, it's like, if you only knew what I was about to go through, if you only knew what it's, what it's going to take for me to get to my prophesied place, if you only knew what it was going to take to get me to that cross and get to this state of redemption and to really see salvation, you would not be asleep. It's, it's, it, it, it's sort of like when, you, when, you, when you're going somewhere with your friends and you, you know the, 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 the pinnacle of the night, you know, we're going to go to the movies, right? And you out, you out to eat and you eat with your friends and you like, I know after this, I'm going to treat everybody to the movies and we're we going to have a good time. They don't even got to pay for anything. And, you know, one of your friends start talking about, ah, I'm, I'm tired. I don't want to go home because secretly she's broke. So she don't got no money to go to the movies anyway. So and, and, and the night continues to go and you're trying to push them like, you know, no, just 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 come on. Come with us after this. Just come. Just come. And they still steady. No, no, no. They don't understand that you already see the end result. And then all you have to do is just press a little bit further. And if you press a little bit further, you'll get to that end destination, but you can't sleep. You can't stay where you are. You can't lose faith and just kind of just let me do all the work. You have to push with me. You got to come with me. You can't just leave me to wow. kind of get there by myself. Wow. So I think that, that, that's, that's how Jesus was feeling in this moment. It's just like, yes, I'm lonely, but it's also because I, I, I have this, you know, I do want this cup to pass because that's my human side. But mm -hmm. my, my divinic side is like, listen, you stay, stay for this, watch this, keep up with me because where, where I'm about to go is, is, is going to blow your mind. So stay with me. So it was just wow. that frustration of that loneliness that I think wow. you know, was really hitting them. Stay with me, stay with, how many times have we silently said that to people who we thought were with us? Stay with me. You know, uh, uh, sometimes we physically and verbally said it, um, but we said, stay with me. I'm going somewhere. I'm doing something. It's, part of the worst seasons of my life, all I need you to do is stay with me. You know, I, I, I realize in moments of agony and tragedy and trauma, presence is better than presence. Right. We often try to give gifts of presence, but sometimes it's your present that's there that does so much more than anything you could ever give me. Jesus kept waking them boys up and said, come on, I just need you here. I just re right now need you here. I need you present. And, and uh, you know, the Bible says, if you desire friends, show yourself friendly. All of us need friends. We need somebody who's just going to be present through the worst season, the worst of the worst, and, and the best of the best. But just be present. And G even Jesus was looking for that presence. But he had gotten to the point of prayer that he didn't need it anymore. He understood, I got to do this alone. And I got to do this by myself. So he went and moved on. So let's let's move on through the, 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 the dynamic of the story. Jesus is now arrested. Judas betrays him. Judas kisses him on the neck. That's, that's a whole message by itself. Judas kisses him on the neck. The soldiers take Jesus. And the first place they take him is to the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, who has to first find him guilty. Uh, People are paid to lie on him. People are paid to accuse him and tell all of these fables and these stories. Probably some of the same people he fed with the two fish and five loaves of bread. But here they are making up these accusation stories because they don't want to get in trouble with the church. They don't want to get in trouble with the temple because in the synagogue day, if you worked against the synagogue, they'll kick you out of the synagogue. Nobody wanted to be kicked out of the synagogue. So they said whatever they want to say. Uh, Caiaphas found them guilty. He now has to be sent to Herod, who's king of the Jews. Uh, Herod now has to find him guilty. Uh, Herod was an interesting character. Uh, and, you know, Herod did his own thing, and he, he was a little crazed and had some issues going on. Herod says, well, if y'all want to find him guilty, fine, go ahead. They send him to Pilate. 
Pilots, you says, I really don't find any fault with this man. I really don't find anything going on with him. Take him back to Herod. He's king of the Jews. Y'all Jews deal with this man. I don't want to deal with him. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is taken back to Herod. Herod doesn't know what to do with him. They send him back to Pilate. So you go see Jesus going through all these trials. He never said anything. He never opened his mouth. You know, the old saints say he never said a mumbling word. <laughs> you know, so he never opened his mouth after all of these accusations. I want you for a moment to chime in and deal with the fact of learning to be silent in the seasons when you're being accused. What, what does that silence feel like? How much discipline and strength does it take to be silent when you know that you're being lied on and the cues. They all the talking. Talk to us about how do you be silent? How do you be silent in that? How do you be silent? Um, I don't think I can give you how to be silent, but I can give um the benefits <laughs> of being silent. <laughs> um, because I'm not I'm not the one to always be silent. You know, if That's I, why have, I ask you, <laughs> <laughs> if I have something to say, I'm, I'm going to approach it um, with as much information as possible. But the truth is, uh, wrong is wrong and wrong always needs a place to sit. So you, you're looking at all of these people who are saying, well, you do it. Well, you do it. Well, you do it. And everyone's like, you know, just passing it on. It reminds me, it goes back to the garden when when sin originated, it was like, oh, it was the woman that you gave me. Oh, no, it was a snake. Oh, it was this, you know, sin is, sin looks for a place to rest his head. It looks for a place to settle. And the truth is when we voice our opinions, which is more like our emotions, we're giving that sin or that wrong a place to lay its head. Mm -hmm. So instead of us responding, um, we're responding, we got to keep in mind our response is most likely an emotional response because we are emotional beings, we are humans, and we're going to give what we feel. And mm -hmm. oftentimes what we feel is not always the right choice or it doesn't always bring justification, right? Mm -hmm. Sin doesn't bring justification against sin or wrong doesn't bring justification against wrong. You're going to be emotional, you're going to be angry, rightfully so, but you're not going to get justice, you're not going to get vengeance because he says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So in our moment of being emotional, finding a place to be silent gives us room to hear him and not so much hear us. Because when those emotions are talking, them things, is, it's loud. It's the loudest, what your emotions can be the loudest voice if you're not still. Wow. If you don't find a place to be still, your emotions are in, in your ear. So being still and not saying nothing, not saying nothing is equivalent to being still. Right. Mm. It's, it's on the same level of meditation almost because you have all these things to say, but you're disciplining yourself not to say it. So in doing so, you're allowing him to feed you what to say or what to do or what the next moves uh, uh, will be. So that's why we see Jesus not saying anything because he knows like he legit. He got a lot of feelings right now. He just said, if it be possible, let these let this cup pass over me. He just expressed that. So we know he has emotions to express, but he knows if I express this. I got legions. Like I got a body of people that can take me up out of here. So if I start talking, I got a gang of people that can really shut all this thing down. So let me be quiet so he can like really fulfill what he needs to fulfill. So that's that's the benefits of being still. You get a great you get a greater result from being quiet than speaking your mind. Wow. Pastor Tay, tell us about the strength of being silent. So um I am not Jesus, just in case you guys. <laughs> And I feel that as a believer or follower of Jesus, sometimes if, if, if we can just modernize the text, Bishop, let, just tell me if I'm going a little bit too far because we are on live. But when, if you put yourself in the place where Jesus was, people were trying to punk him. Okay. Like he walked through the synagogue. He walked through the city. He laid hands, stopped funeral processions, fed people, you know, withered man hand. He has both hands. Demons are, you know, ex, uh, uh, um, are, are removed from people. And, and I just feel that when he got to the place of the garden that we just left, he said it very clearly, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I think Jesus is showing us how to shift into the spirit 
And one thing I had to learn as his follower is to master your emotions. I think Elder Dale was right on that track. Master your emotions. Bishop, you teach us that your mind is the final place of privacy. And when you open your mouth, you reveal your thoughts. And I feel that when, especially when we're on the road of destiny, when we're on the road um, and we're on the trajectory of where God has called us to be, it is very important to know uh, what is spiritual and what is not. Because one slip of the tongue could ruin everything. So what I see is Jesus saying, I know I may look weak to you because silence will have people really sleeping on you. When you're silent and you can justify yourself, vindicate yourself, show some receipts, you get what I'm saying? Like Elder Deo said, Paul, legions of angels. Jesus says, it's not that I'm weak. It's not that I'm tired that I'm silent. I'm actually exemplifying maturity and strength. It is, it, is a, it, is a, it is a mature person that in the face of accusations that you can say nothing. Yes. It is a strengthened person to say, when I am weak, his strength is going to be made perfect. And I know that he can speak on my behalf better than I can. So I, re I reserve the right to remain silent so that my father can speak. Because in just a little while, you're going to see. Uh. Mastering silence, the shift of silence. Yes, go ahead, go ahead. I, I just want to uh, piggyback off of, of what they said. And I also think that this also really is really interesting when you look at like the even historical context, right? Of Jesus is, is brought before Pilate. Mm -hmm. right? He's brought before this governor who his history, history shows that he was, he didn't wait for trials to kill people. He didn't wait for people to be proven uh, uh, guilty before he even uh, uh, tortured them or had them crucified, hung upside down, all types of things, right? And here Pilate is in this moment where he's looking at Jesus and he's like, aren't you gonna speak up for yourself? Like, this, this, like it's just this, this moment of how Jesus' silence kind of changes the character of a man who's usually normally brutal, right? He's usually normally someone who is just off the wind. This is why the religious establishment wanted Jesus to go to Pilate so bad. And here you see Pilate's like, I don't see anything wrong with this man. And this is a man who doesn't need to see anything wrong with someone to, to crucify them or kill him, right? right? So the silence changes in that moment and it even hits Pilate in a way that makes him go, let me try to get myself out of this by sending him to Herod. Yeah. So, and then when he gets that, by the time he gets to Herod, Herod, is a, he's been waiting for this moment to meet Jesus. He's been waiting and longing for this, uh, for this moment. And now it's on his terms. And he doesn't really want to meet Jesus to hear his side of the story. He wants to meet this man so he can see some miracles, so he can be entertained. Mm -hmm. And Jesus' silence goes, not so, right? And then, then you see this political play where Herod now sends him back to Pilate. And so it's like, it's, it's Jesus' silence kind of shows the hand of people and it frustrates Herod, but it also changes in a sense, the character and the moral nature of Pilate. Mm, wow. Wow. His silence that. made a ruthless man confused because Pilate was extremely ruthless uh, and, and, and Jesus silence overpowered it. That's powerful. Uh, so let's, let's walk a little bit further to this. So uh, after Pilate, you know, hears the cry of the Jews that, they want to crucify him. He tried another way out, said, listen, it's Passover. I'm supposed to release a prisoner for Passover. Do y'all want Jesus or do you want Barabbas? They said, well, give us Barabbas, who's a murderer and a thief. They'd rather a murderer and a thief walk through the community than the guy who raised the dead, healed the sick, and fed 5,000 plus people. And, and that's how it, it, was, it, it was clear that God's will was unfolding, though it was a terrible scene. And I think a lot of times we miss the will of God because of the horror of the scene. We miss the will of God because it looks like a horror flick. But God's will is still in motion and in play. Even in COVID-19, somewhere in this horror story that we're all living right now is the will of God. And, and, and it's unfolding before our very eyes. Jesus is took us taken to uh, a prison. Uh, he's, he's commanded to be whipped. 
He's whipped 39 times with cats of nine tails. Literally, his body is ripped. When we take Holy Communion and we break the bread, this is the moment at the whipping block where Jesus' body is literally broken. And the cats of nine tails is ripping his flesh from his back 39 times. And that's not no little taps on the wrist. This is a strong, a huge beast of men whipping Jesus and tearing his flesh with, with chars of glass and metal and ripping him asunder. And he's whipped 39 times. Then they mock him, place the crown of thorns on his head, put a robe around him, say, look at the king of the Jews, mock him, and then tells him to carry his cross. Bear your cross, carry it through the streets. Now, this was a humiliating mockery because they carried him through a street called Via de la Rosa, which was the, the street where they literally uh, mock people. The community had then permission to spit on them and throw things at them and punch them as they walked through the street carrying a crossbar. Uh, Jesus buckles to his knees, him and the cross falls down. They pick a man out of the crowd who was just there to worship for the Passover by the name of Simon of Cyrene, Africa. They, he was there just to worship during the Passover. They pull Simon out of the crowd and say, hey, we want you to come and help him carry this cross. Amazing how Simon picks up the cross, carries it to Calvary, to Golgotha for Jesus, gets to the top of the cross. They nail it, nail him down in it, lift it up the cross, slams it down in a hole. Jesus' body is bare, broken, bruised, battered, and he's dying. He's dying, and I think we miss that. We often miss the reality of this moment, and we we put MGM slacks on it, and we 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 put lights, camera, and actions behind it. But we miss the gruesome, horrific scene that this is. Jesus is dying, but he's dying for us, and he says something finally when he opens his mouth. He's on a cross dying. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I believe that forgiveness is so powerful that Jesus wouldn't die until he made sure that we were forgiven. That's how powerful forgiveness is, that you can't die till you do it. I want, to, I want us to talk about real quickly how forgiveness often holds us back and how forgiveness cripples us. Uh, 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 Chanel, chime in on this. Let's work with forgiveness. How does forgiveness often do us in, do us dirty, holds us back? Come talk about that for a moment. Um, so I, I think this is this is really powerful that he is making this statement even in the midst of what he is personally going through, he is still thinking about other people. Mm -hmm. And I think many times when we're faced with challenges, we kind of cocoon ourselves and we kind of focus on what's going on in our house, but he still was able to think about the repercussions with that was happening to other people. Mm -hmm. And so in this moment, um, you see him in a very vicarious position, but he's praying about, for, he's speaking about forgiveness. and. That's powerful because I, I think I heard it once said like this, like people who hold on to unforgiveness, it's like drinking poison, but expecting the other person to die. And, and I think that that is a great example of why he focused on forgiveness in that moment. Mm -hmm. And I think forgiveness is hard for people in two ways. One, I feel the first way is it's hard for us to forgive people, but it's also hard for us to believe that we are forgiven. Mm. And so I think we, as sometimes as believers, we walk around with this condemnation because we don't believe that we are forgiven. To believe that you are not fully forgiven is to believe that it wasn't finished on the cross. Wow. Wow. So there, there is, some, there is some, some undoing in our thinking. And I think once you understand that you've been forgiven, it makes it easier to now start to forgive others. Wow. So I think there is a, a, a huge connection between you understanding that you're forgiven, you forgiving yourself, and now being able to, to forgive others. 
That's good. That's good. That's good. Come on, Jennifer, while we're chiming on that forgiveness, I think that's really, really good. I, I was just thinking about even, um, you know, as we were saying about how Jesus was in these scenes where um, he was silent. And I think it's so powerful that when he did opt to speak, I feel like he was silent before because he was reserving his strength for this last part of the journey, um, which would be required the most, you know, like, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, he's dying, right? So the physical failure that's happening within his body, um, but now using his last bit of physical strength to speak, to speak. And um, it's just amazing that he reserved all of his energy for what he would need most, you know? And ultimately it shows us that, you know, this is the first step to freedom. You know, Jesus was going wow. through this suffering and ultimately he knew where it would lead. He knew what the outcome would be. But I feel that Jesus wanted to model for us. This is the first step that you will take in order to wow. accomplish freedom. If you do not forgive, then you'll forever be trapped you know, and it was also letting his um, accusers know that like sin was not bigger than his love for us or bigger than his mission for us. You know, ultimately that love and that mission would be bigger than our sin, which is the reason why God can forgive us. He understands that there's a level of ignorance that mankind is walking in because we have not yet fully grasped the revelation of exactly who he who he is you know mm -hmm. at that time people don't were know. Really in the process of figuring out who jesus is some people are understanding something is different about him he's dying in a way that's different from any other and it's not until they see him going through this process on the cross that some people are able to have this revelation but it just shows the grace that jesus has while we catch up with knowledge, while our mind catches up with something that's true, you know, mm -hmm. that he would give us this grace period that I'm going to forgive you because I understand that you don't fully grasp what's happening and you don't fully know the end result. And I believe that wow. for us to get to a level of freedom, we have to do that for people in our own lives. Yeah. And forgive them. That's that's important. That's really good. Somebody write that down and on, on Facebook Live. Forgiveness is the first step to freedom. When you look at when you look at the cross, forgiveness is the first step. Forgiveness is the first step to freedom. And if you really want to be free, forgiving is essential. But then, like you said, for ignorance, forgive who don't know. There's a lot of people that's commenting about you and talking about you and dealing things about they don't know. It's you can forgive who don't know. You don't know me. That's why I can forgive you very easily because you don't know me. Come on, Justin Parr, talk about this. This forgiveness is powerful. No, I, 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 I took it more in a, a personal, um, a personal approach and a personal aspect um, because I noticed that once again, I, I go back to my original point. Jesus knew the table of events. He knew how everything was going to play out, and he knew that ultimately his sacrifice would usher in that forgiveness for us for eternity. Well, not for eternity, for the rest of life on earth. And even knowing that, he still made the effort to verbally speak the words. So mm -hmm. it, uh, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So he knew that there was something important about verbally professing. Not, I, I understand that I'm doing this so that you can forgive them, but I want you to know from my mouth to your ears, I want you to forgive these people. And wow. I, it, it just speaks to how intentional and deliberate everything that Jesus in this time was doing. Everything was deliberate. I, I want you to know that although I wanted this cup to pass, I want you to know that although they're mocking me right now, I want you to know that although I can't breathe right now, I want you to know although I have blood running down from the crown of my head because of these thorns, although I'm in, this was literally the lowest point of Jesus's life and his ministry, but it was the highest pinnacle of salvation for us. So he was literally at the highest point of salvation. And he's like, listen, I, I, I understand what's happening right now, 
but <laughs> I understand. But at the end of the day, I want you to forgive them. And I want you to know that this is coming from Ooh. my mouth. This is coming from me. Ooh. Jesus low was our high. Yeah. Hey, he's yeah. at his lowest. So we could be at our highest. I mean, that is, that's remarkable right there. That remark. And it gives segue to the next statement that he makes. To he's hung between two thieves. He's hung between two thieves. And 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 between the two thieves, he looks at one who say, uh, if you can save us, save yourself, save us, save yourself. Look at the other one says, we deserve to be up here because what we did and how we lived. But he looks at the one who understood who he was and what he did and said, today you shall be with me in paradise. Today you shall be with me in paradise. While Jesus thought forgiveness was important, he also wouldn't die till he showed the purpose of his death, which was salvation. Right. Let, let, I, want, I want to ask y'all this question. Why does it seem, in my opinion, and I could be very wrong, but why does it seem that the salvation message is lost? It seems like to me, churches and preachers are not focused as much on getting people saved anymore. Can we, can we work with this for a minute? Are we preaching? We, we got, we catching flights and not feelings. We itinerate. We we on everybody's CD. We we got podcasts out. We got you know we doing the thing. We 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 securing the bag. Why is it? it and I could be very wrong. It could be my small circumference of influence and friends, but it doesn't seem like the salvation message and getting people saved is as important as it should be. Jesus thought it was to die for. Is that message getting lost? Do y'all do y'all feel the same? Somebody chime in on this. Anybody can take it. Is that message getting lost? <laughs> I'll jump in. Um, um, yeah, I think I think that it has been lost in some way, shape, or form um, because of just well, not everywhere. And I'll say this: I can only speak from my context. Right? We live in. Uh, we live in America. We have a very privileged society where like, the message of salvation or the, the idea of, you know, uh, heaven, getting to heaven and understanding the, the need for that, in a sense, to some people is a distant thought. Even the, the average Christian, in a sense, you go to, go to church on Sundays, you, you go to Bible study throughout the week. But outside of that, there's an absence of thinking about the, the message of Christ and how for so long we we've allowed capitalism to kind of infiltrate the church. And we've kind of positioned ourselves with this idea that the American dream is the fulfillment of the kingdom of God, where, where, where it's not. And so you have churches have, the, in a sense, lost its power and it's lost its, 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 its sting or it's lost its anointing in a sense because it's moved more towards industry. And so wow. when we move towards that, we think about, what can we get from the almighty savior here on earth rather than understanding like naturally uh, rather than what are we going to have eternally and so when it comes to like money and it comes to media and it comes to advertising and all these different things the message of salvation gets lost because people are more so focused on making heaven here rather than understanding the need and the, the uh, and the desire to live with christ in eternity and so that I genuinely think that that there's this idea that the kingdom of God is not necessarily being preached, is not necessarily being taught. The principles that we've said is the kingdom of God are actually the principles of the American dream, capitalism. Um, and so that's what I will look at and say that's why there's a, a shift from focusing on salvation. Wow. Wow. Somebody else chime in on that. The focus of salvation. The focus think, of salvation. Um, I think also there's a lot of there's a lot of sorry did I go out? No, yeah, you're good. I think there's also a lot of backtrack work that has to be done. Um, unfortunately, there's been so many people, uh, whether non-believers or uh, what the church would call the backslider, um, there's been so many people that have been berated and attacked from the pulpit and attacked about things that have nothing to do with salvation almost. 
um, and put into this, this box of, I can't accept salvation until I know all of these things are correct. Mm. And it makes it, I, I believe personally, for anyone who is kind of venturing away from that talk of salvation, I think it, it becomes too, it's like a landfill. Like they, they don't want to tiptoe towards that conversation because it's like, if I say this, because uh, you can't talk about salvation without talking about holiness. You can't talk about holiness without talking about like. So it, it's like I, I don't want to tiptoe into that landfill and, and, and accidentally step on somebody's toes. I don't lost ten members because I don't said that. I don't want you, you know. It, it's it's just a landfill, and I think a lot of people they try to, um, in a sense, I can only call it compromise. They try to compromise and 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 edit uh, what they say to to where it doesn't exactly hit people and hurt people and cause people to really cringe and really go back into that field. But if you really study what salvation is and what salvation came to do, it's going to make you cringe. It has to hit your heartstrings. So it's like you almost can't avoid um, stepping on somebody's toes when you're talking about getting saved and the process to salvation and the process to maintaining that salvation. So Wow. So what, what I'm hearing there then is that the message of salvation has been compromised because of the need to be politically correct. In my opinion. And our political correctness doesn't allow us to preach the fullness of the love of Christ at Calvary and the need for Christ because of sin. Right. And so political correctness can sometimes compromise that. Yeah, that, that salvation message, I think it should be the important message. Like some churches are not even doing altar calls anymore calling people to mm -hmm. salvation, offering them, you know, you used to say, open the arms of Christ, come to Jesus, you know, uh, opening the arms of Christ and off asking people, do they want to come to Christ? Is that still an important message? Is that still an important message? Does it, does it have any value? Talk to us. Um, this, this saying to me, it gives a perfect image of the relationship between the pulpit and the pew. Like, right, you have Jesus here on the cross who is who would be representing the pulpit speaking to, you know, the criminal um, on the side of him who would be the pew, like someone who is guilty, like he did it. He's not he's not saying he didn't, he's guilty of it. We all know he did it. You know what I mean? He's a he's a known criminal. It, it was very descriptive. Like he was a known criminal. Everyone knows what he did. But yeah, we have this Messiah, the Savior, still having a simple conversation with him, showing he's not above conversation with the or with the average Joe or with someone who's not a clergy member or someone who's not even saved. Like in this very moment, we see how uh, someone can get access directly to the father without going through a pastor or a preacher or a bit like he didn't have to go through anybody. Mm -hmm. This image is, is very powerful to me because this criminal right here is talking directly to the father, which is what Christ came to do. He wanted to give us access directly to the Father. So here we are, we have a criminal, someone who's done something we've probably all done, and simply say, look, all of that aside, I, I just keep a place for me, right? I, I want, I've i done all I can do. I've, I've messed up. I've made my mess, and I'm paying for it. Can you just keep, because at the end of the day, I must have, he must have heard something that Jesus was preaching to know something about the kingdom. He must have heard this message some way, somehow, yet still fell in sin, yet still wound up being a criminal, doing whatever it is, it is that he did to wind up in jail, to wind up being crucified. Still, he remembered the message and said, look, keep a place for me. I, I just need a place where you going. And wow. that, to me, is just really powerful because that shows that anybody, we're talking about the power of salvation, anybody can speak directly to the savior to christ and yeah. in that moment can be saved yeah. right we're talking about being saved his salvation didn't have a three-piece suit on it his salvation didn't come with a dress his, his salvation didn't have a form but it had power because he was able to confess at that moment this is king this is messiah this is lord just save a place for me and he had a spot right then and there so i, I for me the dichotomy of uh, Jesus being the pulpit and the criminal being uh, the pew, it just shows that relationship of what that relationship should look like. The other other criminal yeah. just came for me. If you got all that power, get yourself down, right? If you got, and Jesus, could, we talk about emotions, he could have responded like, dude, I really could get myself off of this. I really could get down from this, 
but I'm gonna just go ahead and have this conversation with somebody who needs me. I don't need the gossip. I don't need the, 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 the nonsense. I need to talk to this brother right here who needs salvation. And that's, that image is the power of salvation for me. Yeah, the touchability. We see the touchability of Jesus right here where a thief, a male factor can have a conversation right with the savior right there one-on-one, -on -one. He, he's not afraid to dialogue and talk with them. He's not afraid to, you know, to converse with them. I think that's a powerful, powerful scene. He didn't come through a three-piece suit. He didn't come through a robe and a miter and all those other grand things. He, he had a straight conversation with Christ and he yes. obtained salvation. I think that's very, very powerful. Um, and I'm sorry, at that, I'm sorry, but at that moment, Christ looked just like him. Jesus right. looked just like him in that moment. So it was somebody he could relate to. It was somebody he can identify with. He didn't come in a uniform. He came looking just like him. So he was a, he was comfortable enough to have that conversation with him. Awesome. Hey, Bishop, can I add one thing? Oh, Pastor Tay, go ahead. If I can, thank you. And I'll go right back to you, um, Minister Tariq. So really quickly, just piggybacking because the story of the cross just excites me. Like we're having an internal dialogue, you know, in our chat. Like the story of the cross to me is a mirror of creation. And the initial question that you asked was, have we gotten away from talking about salvation, you know, really having the altar call? And I think that where Jesus was and still is in his mission has been actually altered by the modern day church. Mm -hmm. Our missions are different. That's why our approach is different. That's why our outcomes are different. Really quickly, just, just give me 30 seconds. If you study theological thinking, you would see that all of the leaders in the beginning, whether you studied art, whether you studied law, whether you studied um, any type of um, like liturgy or, or literary skills, I should say, or you studied theology, everybody read the same book. Everybody read the same authors, but they said theology was the queen of the sciences, right? So you could be a painter, you could be a lawyer, you could be an engineer, but everybody knew the same exact thing. Where we got to right now in America, because Minister Lang put us in the context of, of America, we are in a post-Christian, post-modern society. So I believe that the church is playing catch up. I believe that we are in a very defensive mode in which if we want to fill our churches, if we want people to come, then we need to cater to securing the bag, catching flights. And I'm all about abundance. I'm all about prosperity. But I believe that there is um, there is a balance because Jesus's mission, uh, we talk about Christ over culture. He never came to blend in with the culture of the time. He was a revolutionary, right? He came to literally turn everything that they knew on its head. So I believe that our, our stance and our approach, believing that those of us that are even on this Zoom line, although we are all in our 30s um, and some of us are in our 40s, we are desiring, just, just a few, just some, maybe two. Okay, so we are desiring to- I'm, I'm 29. <laughs> We are desiring, let me stay focused, y'all, to really show um, a modern representation of Christ that, yes, you can have the luxury of this world, but salvation is still the key. We are nothing save the cross. Let me just make that clear. This weekend is pivotal. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, aside from this weekend, we are like everyone else that's walking on planet earth. Aside from this weekend, we are literally, there's nothing that's different. Christianity or the, the cross is literally what distinguishes. It's our line of demarcation. So I believe as ministers of the gospel, as epistles uh, in 2020 that are going to be written by men that are going to see us on Facebook and on YouTube and on Instagram, we have a responsibility to do as as our leader did. Even if you take off the lipstick and the earrings and, and, and all of the all of the facade, Jesus's mission never changed, regardless if he was on a boat or if he was on a cross. His mission was always about souls. And he told us he that wins souls is wise. So I feel that a lot of our churches are not meeting budgets. I'm about to go there for 30 seconds and we're not getting the results that we want because we're not fishing according to the master fisherman. He said, if you want to be wise, win souls. Excellent. And that's what victory is.
That's where it is. <laughs> Having the same mission as Christ. Right. Eric, and then I got to move on. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I just, I think, uh, just as Dale had hinted at, and we were all talking and past, building on Pastor Tay, it's just mind blowing how Jesus's perspective kind of went beyond what the thief on the cross mindset was, right? And so as I was, I was reading one of the commentaries, it pointed out something that I never looked at. The thief on the cross said, uh, uh, when you enter your kingdom one day, mm -hmm. remember me, you know, remember me because so, and I want to be a part of that. But Jesus' response was kind of beyond just this distant future. Jesus' response, it says, today, right? And then he responds to the part where he says, remember me. He says, I won't just remember you. You'll be with me. And then he adds, not in a kingdom, but in a paradise, right? And this idea that it's going to be a beautiful, enjoyable place. And that, so Jesus kind of goes when he off when the south when salvation is offered it's not this thing where we have we serve this transcendent god jesus says i bring you near to me right i connect you to me and that you won't just i won't just remember you but you'll reign with me and yeah. so looking at this 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 moment on on the cross it's just fascinating and it's just even i don't even think i we mentioned it at the, at the beginning but one of the things that's really interesting is the the actual physical dynamic that Jesus is experiencing right now, yeah. right, is actually it's a miracle that he's actually still able to speak. It's right. a miracle that they're actually even having this conversation because of the the, the, the there's a lack in their ability to even breathe. Yeah, yeah. When, the physical, the physical when you're being physical, and Jesus so Jesus is uttering these. Yeah, it's just a matter of like, wow, this is a miracle. And all of this is just a, the, showing the mighty power that God had in all of this. And how, like I said at the beginning, he didn't, he didn't, his life wasn't taken from him. He was in control the whole time. Yeah. Let, 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 me, let me go to that next uh, powerful point that Jesus did on the cross. When he looked down from the cross, because we're having a conversation around the cross, and we're not going to be too much longer, guys. We're going to be... I, I, <laughs> All of y'all like me. Um, so uh, we, 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 we see, we're having a conversation around the cross, and around the cross is Mary, Mary, and Mary, and John. And uh, the three Marys, and there's John around the cross. Jesus looks at the foot of the cross, and he looks at his, see his mother. And he says, woman, behold your son. Talking about John. And then he says, behold your mother. And so he, he's doing something right now that Mary and John kind of catch eyes. It's like, what is he talking about? Maybe he's hallucinating. Maybe he's losing it because he's bleeding out. He's dying. Uh, uh, I don't know what's going on, but he's saying son and mother and woman. What's going on here? Jesus changing relationships and he's caring for his mother. His last and final act as her eldest son is caring for his mother. I want us to see and talk about for a moment the power of the cross with your family. The power of the cross with your family. Most of you right now are quarantined with their family and it's driving them crazy. I gotta live with these people. I gotta live with this person that we usually go out of the house. We usually pass at each other. We usually, you know, hide by and I'm going. We maybe sleep at the same hours if we don't work different hours, but you now, quarantine locked up feel probably feel like a jail cell and your family member is your cellmate and you gotta live with these people so <laughs> it's now how does the cross relate to family let's talk about that for a moment you quarantine with them right now you in the house with them right now what does that feel like somebody promise more talk to me about family <clears throat> i i love this part of the um the cross story because i feel like it shows um it shows how jesus like pastor Tate talked about being balanced and i feel like it shows how jesus was so with all that he was experiencing he was still sensitive to those who were close to him and um just like the ultimate act of unselfishness is leaving a legacy for your loved ones, right? And um, I just, I love this part because I feel like 
he experienced the the sorrow he knew what he was gonna have to go through um like even looking back in john it kind of like talks to like as he was prepping his disciples and talking with them about all the the terrible things he was gonna ex, you know experience and he would literally he was saying like in a little while i'm gonna experience this in a little while i'm gonna experience that and how like sorrow is gonna be there but then i think for him seeing his own mother in that moment have to witness what was going through him i feel like it shows a level of of passion that he had about just making sure that he was securing his his family and i think that some it's just such a powerful um testimony to us about remembering like priorities right um one thing about this pandemic is like it's very quickly revealed what is important versus what is not important. Um, and this is a time where literally um, people are being um, forced to make very difficult decisions. And you can see like the, the uh, it, it requires a level of selflessness that mm -hmm. is being required of us right now. And I feel like at that moment, Jesus was modeling for us like a level of selflessness to say like, I have secured, I have secured you and just reassuring Mary that like her purpose, because I'm sure all these years her life has been focused on, on Christ, you know, as a parent, you know, this, you put your heart and soul into this and then you see it seemingly like die in failure and it's hard it's easy for us to say now like his victory in the cross but it's i can imagine it was hard at that time to see the suffering and it feel like victory right so it seems like this thing that i've poured my whole heart and soul into is died and in the most humiliating sorrowful moment so when jesus had an opportunity to secure her and connect her with some someone who he knows like you're going to look out for her and she has this future. I feel like it really reminds us that one, he, he was always thinking big picture, that he was a planner and that family matters, you know, in this time, you know, they have all these campaigns, like, why are you staying home? Oh, I'm staying home for this. I'm staying home for my mom. I'm staying home for my grandmother or whatever. We cannot lose, um, track or we can't lose sight of the fact that our family is our very first the very first way that God connects us here on this planet and if we're going to be a light to the world we have to start off being that light to our family because we can't be a light to a world and we're not even a light within our own that's home. so true that's so very true Tariq Lane go ahead Yeah, no, I, I I love what Prophetess was saying about definitely being a light and definitely looking at how this this moment, I think, has done one thing for me and it's built my level of understanding and grace, right? Because just not how just it's just not about even the people I'm in, in the home with, but it's also about how I I understand how people are processing this moment. Um, it's, it's really easy to get into like this moment where you think, well, we all have this free time. We all doing this. We all got things we can be building and working on. But at the end of the day, everyone's not in a position of privilege to be thinking in that way, right? We all have an ability to um, to grow. We all have an ability to reflect and have use this moment in a positive way. But a lot of people are going through some difficult situations. You sure. have friends and family who have severe anxiety. And just the, the thought of a news clip that says anything about coronavirus sends them over the edge. And this moment has, I've used the power of choice to understand how am I going to be graceful? How am I going to be understanding? How am I going to be uh, mindful of what they're dealing with? And channeling just how Jesus operated, right? And the idea of grace, the idea of how you connect with people, how you understand where they are, and use that to, to not push them or try to motivate them, but just to love people because yeah. it's processing through this differently. Yeah. There are people who, are, who, who don't have a job. There are people who don't have money. There's, how am I extending grace in this moment? Yeah. What, am I, what example am I being of Christ in this moment? How am I meeting needs? How am I understanding? How am I loving? Because honestly, I'm not easy to live with. 
And so I can't, <laughs> right? I can't expect everyone, someone else to be easy to live with because we all have our own minds, we all have our own understandings. But this moment has really pushed me to understand when it comes to family, family matters. Frivolous things don't matter. Family uh, matters. <laughs> family matters, right? Other things don't matter. People that you are connected to, or people that we are connected to are leaving this earth left and right. And if you have the opportunity to love someone, if you have yeah. the opportunity to care for someone, take that, take advantage of that. That's good. That's good. Dale, we have you chime in on this. Come on. I always cut this Elder Dale off. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Pastor Stray, go ahead. Really quickly because it's personal. Like I love this um part of the story because you see what Jesus is doing spiritually, he also does naturally, and that he is blending a new family together, right? So it's like I'm a product of a blended family, right? And it's like it it's not even necessarily your biological that will always do it for you. Jesus is showing us a natural and a spiritual reflection that family is people that are connected by destiny and assignment. Wow. Because John was the one that laid on his breast and it was, he was the beloved, right? Um, and this is going to be real preach for, for just like 15 seconds, right? So when I was studying this one time with my dad and I had to preach this word at the seven last saints, like when we were actually used to be in church, it was like, he was telling me that Mary, um, she was the one that had Jesus, carried Jesus, nurtured Jesus. So watch, this is about to be real good. She almost was like the alpha, right? She's the one that saw the beginning. Gabriel's the one that gave her. Now, if y'all preach this y'all give me the tithe okay and i'll split it with bishop so um she's the one that had the revelation because gabriel came to her home or well, watch this at the cross jesus connected her with john who later has the revelation on the isle of patmos so he is the omega so what jesus is saying is as long as these two are connected my work can continue and i know that that was good so he's blending families together that even in his absence his presence can still continue Elder Dale, over to you. <laughs> that was good. I'll try to say something after that. Um, where was I? You want to connect all these dots and whatnot. Um, the, what's far from me is, is he calls her, he doesn't call her mother, he calls her woman, right? He addresses her as woman. And it keeps going back to that thing in the garden where the prophecy was, was announced that, you know, to the woman, that the seed of the woman is going to crush your head, right? And you're going to bruise his heel. So to me, it was, uh, it's illustrating him announcing woman, like this, this happened, it's done, right? That, that prophecy that was told back in the garden, woman, is that this is the seed of the woman that's crushing your head, say, in, on top of everything you try to do to humanity, right? To try to get at God or whatever you thought you was doing, everything you've done through huma to humanity from the garden, through the generations, through David, through Abraham, through like we're talking about a long gap, a long time. All of that, the moment he announced woman, he fulfilled that prophecy of crushing the devil's head. Because wow. at this point, at this point, I'm leaving it in the hands of those who used to labor with me. We're talking about John. I, I can leave it. You know, you can leave something when somebody else can carry it on. So he left this thing in the hands of somebody that can carry it on. So he didn't announce as mother, he announced her as woman. So that prophecy can be fulfilled. You know what I'm saying? And to, to, to piggyback on, um, I believe it was Melissa Light, when you're talking about legacy, you're talking about family. Like at the end of the day, we can preach. We talking about Jesus here. We, we're talking about, you can preach to whoever, you can preach to congregations. And that's great. Trust me, I'm not knocking that. I preach in congregations, but I'm talking, you preach to your family. Take care of your family. At the end of the day, if all these churches that you preach at are getting saved, they're getting delivered, if all of these synagogues, all of these temples, all of these cathedrals are growing because of your message, what's happening at home? What's going on with your family? Is the same message being translated and being received and, and downloaded into your family? Jesus made sure his family was straight before he took off. So that those were the two uh, points I wanted to make from this. From this uh, saying, well, well, I'll be preaching both of them. <laughs> you can't save the world <laughs> at the cost of your family. You mm -hmm. can't save the world and lose your house. Yeah, Jesus took care of his family. 
Gone be the day where people lose their homes for the sake of ministry. Your family does not have to be the price for your ministry. Mm. You don't have to. You don't have to lose your house to have an itinerant schedule or to be known in preaching or whatever it is that you do. And so that's very, very powerful. I want to walk through these last couple of ones real quickly, but I want I want to highlight some salient points so that we can really, really, really get some revelation of the reality of what Christ was feeling. And it's at this moment, the center moment, that Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When he speaks those words, when he speaks that, at that moment, the Bible says that the darkness comes and covers the face of the earth, and Jesus is now, he feels forsaken. Can, can you guys describe personally moments in life or ministry that you felt forsaken? What is that moment of forsaken feels like when it's always been with you, you always had people with you, but now you feel alone? Maybe it's in quarantine, maybe it's with coronavirus. That feeling of forsaken, God, have you left me? I know I personally felt like that. I can definitely chime in on this word right here. Uh, this April uh, 17th and next week, I'll be in ministry for 27 years. I have felt forsaken uh, and, and pastoring for 17 years. There's been moments where while pastoring, you're supposed to be the one to have all the answers. You're supposed to have the vision. You're supposed to know what you're doing. But then sometimes we have to make some faith moves and faith decisions. And we're not sure if this thing going to work out. We're not sure if this going to come to pass the way we thought it. And it's just like, you'll, you'll take anything from God. God, I'll take a whisper. I'll take you if you blow on me, if you breathe on me. I'll take anything. And sometimes it feels like you're praying and God is just not there. The feelings of being uh, feeling forsaken. It doesn't mean that he really forsake me, but I certainly feel like he did. Um, making a decision, feeling forsaken. Uh, dealing with tragedy and trauma. I knew I had an issue with God because it was for a long time, Crown Ministries was in existence. And because it was a fairly young church, you know, we didn't have a lot of deaths in our church. We, you know, people, it was a young church. People hardly died in our church. But the first two funerals in our church, or in our church experience and hosted, was my grandmother and my sister. That's the first two funerals we ever hosted in our church. So I'm like, hey God, you know, where are you? Where are you in, the, in, in, in this moment? You could be in the middle of your purpose. You could be in the middle of your destiny. You could be in the middle of the will of God for your life and still feel like God has walked out and left me. I want you guys to help talk me through that. Counsel me for a moment for the next five minutes and help me counsel me through this forsaken feeling and this, this issue of being forsaken. Come on, talk me through it. I think um, for me um, personally, mine is, is my most recent season um, of back in December when I lost my son. Um, I went through a period, especially after um, the loss was fresh, I went through a period of literally being so, it was almost like I was so angry with God that I, my prayer life tripled because I wanted to tell him so much how angry I was with him. Wow. So I, I was talking to him more and trying to get more of an answer uh, uh, and, and trying to get so much of a response that I was praying more and more and more. And I literally felt, I, I feel like if, if I had to put words to how I felt, it would literally be this moment. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You know, as you sit there and you, you, you really, you're, you're trying to get, you know, some type of comfort. You're really trying to get some answer. You're trying to get some type of motivation to keep going and, and honestly to keep living. And it wasn't until, I mean, if you really, if you really look at, the, the my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Those words were already spoken prophetically by David in Psalms 22, right? Mm -hmm. So once again, this is just showing that Jesus already knew that this was coming. So that was another prophecy already fulfilled, right? So he knew why he was forsake, forsaken or forsa forsaken. Is that, that the word? That's the word. There you go. I'm going to use it. He, he knew the reason why, but yet he still asked the question. And I think that's 
that's the place that I, I, I was in. I, I knew that I may not ever get an answer for what it was that I went through. I knew that I wasn't anyone and I was not sovereign and I was not above God. So if God never chose to answer me, I knew I had to one day be okay with it. I knew that if I chose to continue to live. I knew that I would one day have to look in the mirror and say, I don't know why. Wow. And I think that, 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 that speaks to that season of not hearing anything and feeling so desperate. You have to get to a place to where you literally make a decision. You have to make a decision to continue on. There's, mm -hmm. there's, and you know, there's, there's different seasons for everybody. Everybody has, you know, their own measure of how they deal with things. But I think that everyone is going to have a season to where they feel like God has forsaken them and they have to choose to keep going. They have to choose to continue to have faith because yeah. God is really looking at you to try to see, you know, are you only having faith in me because I keep answering when you pray? Mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. only anchored in the fact that whenever you pray, I answer. Whenever you need money, wow. I answer. What happens when I let you go two or three months without speaking a word to you? You, know, you lost your job. I don't provide for you. What, what happens when you don't have an answer or a response from you or the response that you want? Mm -hmm. And I think when I went through that period and when I came out of it and I finally did get that comfort, it was just like, wow, I got the comfort after I made the decision to keep going. I got wow. the comfort and I got the response that I needed to really carry me through after I said, you know what? I may not hear from you right now. This may be hard to deal with. It may be hard on me, but at the end of the day, I know that you still are sovereign. You're still in control and everything's going to be all right. So after I made that decision, that's when I got my answer. Powerful. The, I, I wanted to talk to God because I was angry, but mm -hmm. all of that talking to God was nothing but a stronger prayer life. That's powerful. That's God can handle my anger. That's good. That's good, 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 good stuff. Go ahead, Elder Dale, help me with this. Help me. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, Brother Justin, you 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 said a lot there. I, I'm gonna say it's with God. I'm learning. Say what you need to say. You know, if you're gonna, <laughs> in, if you're gonna be emotional with anybody, be emotional to Him because He get I, Jesus not speaking, not saying anything is he knew the level of power and authority that he had. So he knew the kind of damage he could do. You know what I mean? So, but him speaking to God, like he let all, I've been quiet all this time. I, I haven't said anything. I let it go. I've been, let, and all of that build up. Like we all can relate to that. When we let things go, especially when that's not our personality, that's not our nature. We want to confront things head on. If it, Letting it go and really saying what you got to say to God, He's not intimidated by what you say this all the time, Bishop. He's not intimidated by with tears. He's not intimidated, intimidated by emotions. However, I'm learning. He welcomes it. Mm. He welcomes those emotions. He welcomes those fears. He welcomes that anxiety. Like literally I've in the last five years of my life, I felt emotions that I never felt before. Like I, I never experienced like with having a family, having a wife, having kids, it's a different set of emotions than walking by yourself. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's, you take on things that you didn't even know existed, but at the end of the day, if you can't uh, uh, sit there and look at him and be like, look, what, I feel like you left me. That's what Jesus was like. Why have you forsaken me? We all know reading it that he didn't forsake, he didn't leave him. But in that moment, bleeding, being stabbed, being, your beard has been ripped up. Like you have been through the worst of the worst and still no answer, still no conversation. You haven't said nothing yet. I prayed, I fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. So I shouldn't need to pray right now. I shouldn't have to say anything, but you're not talking to me in the worst time. Yeah. Literally us feeling that is it for me is God allowing us to know, look, you have the right to feel. However, bring it to me. Whatever that is, just bring it to me. That's you, you feel like I left you? Fine. I know what they say in the church. You shouldn't question God. You said, no, question me. Ask the questions. Say what you need to say. Get it off your chest. That's yeah. what I feel like. This, this is one of my, if not my favorite saying, because it shows that humanity in Christ, that humanity with Jesus, yeah. that yeah. he can express himself and be as emotional to him, but not to the people that's talking to him. Isn't it refreshing to know that God can handle me when I'm angry? Isn't it refreshing to know that he can handle me when I'm upset? You know, some of us, we wild out. We do, don't hold me back. Don't hold me back. You know, but God can handle that with us. And I think that to me, that's refreshing as well. Pastor Chanel, chime in on this. And then I'm going to take all you on a journey. Come on. 
Pastor Chanel. Okay, so um, I love everything that you guys said. It's so powerful. And I think when I think about this statement and he's coming to this moment where he yells this out, um, I think it, it, it says a lot. I think the fact that he says, my God, my God, already he's putting the emphasis on God. I feel like this was the last straw. I've been forsaken by my disciples. I've been forsaken by my friends. The people I ministered to ain't even here. And now it's God. Like, you know, this was the final straw that broke the, the back, you know? And I feel like this was his, his moment to point out something that's really significant because it goes back to the question you asked earlier about why aren't we, our churches not preaching the gospel is salvation not being preached. And I feel like churches are, preaching, but we're not preaching the gospel. And the way we know that the gospel is not being preached is two significant ways. When you ask the average believer about their faith, they're not able to explain it. They're not able to articulate it. If you say, well, what, what's the significance of the blood? You, know, Why did he have to die? Uh, what, what's the significance of his resurrection? People cannot answer that because we're preaching, but we're not preaching the gospel. And so when you see this at the cross and he's saying, my God, my God, he's, he's having this moment that really brings us to the point that I love the most about his death. I, he was revealing in that moment that the process was working because at the cross, he had to be separated because of sin. If that was the proof that the sin of humanity was being placed on him, that there was now a disconnection between him and the father. Okay, and that was the proof that the process was working, which many people don't see it that way, but that was the significance of him being on the cross. He yeah. came to die. His death Great. was the price, but his resurrection was the proof. So his death was paying the price, the ransom. He was being our ransom at that moment, and his resurrection was proof. It was the receipt that it had already been done. So this very significant that he had to die. He had to feel that separation because the only thing that can separate you is sin. This is me running across the running across the virtual screen. <laughs> That's a run. That's a run in the dance. <laughs> Just be shouting right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is it. This is the moment. This is the moment where he's take he's taking sin. He's separated from the Father. This is the moment. And uh, and he's doing it, and he's doing it well. That's so powerful. Let's go a little bit further into this. The next thing that Jesus makes on the cross is, I thirst. Um, and, you know, so there, there, there's the, the natural side of it, that the soldiers, when they heard that, I thirst, took a sponge, dipped it in some vinegar, and kind of squeezed it on his mouth, uh, you know, because they, they heard him say he was thirsty. So they, they're assuming that it is this natural thirst that he has. But it's it's not a natural thirst. It's really a thirst for his assignment, a thirst for his, posi for his uh, purpose to be fulfilled. He's thirsty for souls to be saved. Um, he's thirsty for that. Um, he's thirsty for the reason why his father sent him to this earth. He wants to now drink the cup that he was asking pass from me. The same cup he was trying to get rid of he now said, all right, I got it. I got, because watch this. Once you have endured a season of feeling forsaken with God, you can take anything. Bring it. Bring it. Once you have endured a season and felt like God has left you, and though he really didn't, but you certainly feel that way, I'm telling you, you can endure anything. So Jesus is like, bring it on, devil. Eat your heart out. I'm thirsty. I want more. I want to fulfill purpose. If I got to go this way, let's go. I'm ready to die because I've already experienced the worst. I want to ask you a question, each of you, and I want each of you to answer this question using a one-word answer. What are you thirsty for? What are you thirsty for? I want you to give me a one-word answer. I want everybody that's on Facebook that's viewing this live, I want you to write in your comments, what are you thirsty for? I want you to think about that just for a moment. And I want you to write in the comments, what are you thirsty for? Jesus thirsty for his purpose, fulfilling his assignment. He's thirsty for souls. Bring it on. I'll take the drink of it. I'm ready to drink this cup. What are you thirsty for? What is it that you desire? Come on, give it to me.
I know y'all thinking. <laughs> Pastor Tay, come on, you go first. What are you thirsty for? That's a talkative one first. Um, my one word would be fulfillment. Mm, thirsty for fulfillment. See, that's why y'all supposed to go first. Did somebody take your word? <laughs> thirsty for fulfillment. Elder Dale, what's your word? What are you thirsty for? Success. Thirsty for success. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. What are you thirsty for? Good. Brother Justin Parr, what are you thirsty for? Uh, I think my one word would be confidence. Confidence. Yeah. Okay. Thirsty for confidence. Good. Jennifer Mulberry, what are you thirsty for? Should be last. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really trying to think. Um, okay, we'll come back. Tyreek Lane, what are you thirsty for? Fulfillment. <laughs> Fulfillment. Okay. Chanel, what are you thirsty for? Uh, demonstration. Demonstration. Mm. Powerful. Okay. Um, okay, Jennifer Mowry, we're back at you. What are you thirsty for? It's me again? Wow. Yeah. Oh. Um. I guess maybe satisfaction. Satisfaction. Good. Me, if I was to say what I'm thirsty for, I'm thirsty for legacy. I'm thirsty for legacy. I want to see, and I was purposeful. I could have called any preacher to join me on this live tonight. I wanted to hear from some rising voices. Uh, uh, fortunate enough for me, that is uh, rising voices that I have a, a influence over. But I believe that we don't do a good enough job as they did in the Bible to prepare the next generation, to prepare who is next. In this time where leaders are dying at an alarming and rapid rate, I see the enemy trying to cause a war and having the discussion of who's next and the illegitimates fighting for the seats that don't belong to them. It is important that anyone who has any level of influence, it is imperative and essential that they secure legacy so that there is continuity in the gospel message. We have to do it. It was important in, in the days of Moses, it was make sure you tell your children, tell your children this story, tell your children what happened in Egypt, tell the children of the story of the Red Sea. They all heard this story that we got to Gideon. Gideon says, where's the God of our fathers who delivers over the Red Sea? Gideon wasn't even a part of the Red Sea, but he told that story because he heard it so much. They heard it so much. It was a, a handing down of the story. And I believe that we have to be thirsty for all of the things that you guys mentioned, but also for me particularly, uh, being thirsty for legacy and understanding that we have to pass this down. We can't hold on to it. Uh, it, it, it shouldn't die with us. It should go beyond us. And if your vision is as big as you, your vision is far too small. It should outlive you. It should be bigger than you. It should outweigh you. And, uh, and, and that's important to me. And so, so Jesus finally says, it is finished. And then he said, Father, into thy hand, I commend my spirit. The seventh utterance of Jesus was, Father, into thy hand, I commend my spirit. I want, I want to part here and I want to I want to talk about this. Tyler Perry started <laughs> something on social media with everybody singing. He's got the whole world in his hands. And so what does it mean to you being in the hand of God during this quarantine, during this, uh, this pandemic? What does it mean to you guys being in God's hands? What does that mean to you? Let's talk about that for a moment. And we're going we're gonna to pull it in on this. What does it mean to you being in God's hands? I'll I'll jump in. I'll say that it to me it, it's a it's a form of safety, right? And so 
Um, I've talked a little bit earlier with people who are dealing with anxiety and so much frustration. There, 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 I'll admit, there's a level of anxiety. There's some fear, there's some lack of understanding with, 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 with everything that's going on. But however, I've never felt more safe. Mm. I've never felt more protected. I've never felt more confident that myself and everyone connected to me, God will bring through. Yes. Uh, and so even when things come up, even when sicknesses come up, arise, and people are sick, it, I, I feel this sense of, of safety, of, of, of peace, and knowing that nothing that comes my way can actually take me out of God's hands. Mm. That's good. That's good. That's good. I feel safer than I've ever felt before because I'm secure that I'm in his hands. Good. Somebody else could jump in on that. That's um, good. Build on that thought that Minister Ty had. Um, it's a little bit different for me because um, my brother and I are down here, but we're separated from our entire family. Right. So I'm listening to the news reports. I'm checking in with all of my family <laughs> um, outside of Pastor Chanel. We're the only two that are outside of New York right now. Um, and the only thing that I have been doing and I had to remind myself the other day um, that even before I knew anything about God, I was in his hands. Mm. So with all the knowledge that I have now, why would I think that I would no longer be in his hands? Mm -hmm. so I was putting myself in the remembrance that he's been taking care of me before I could even give him the gratitude to say thank you for taking care of me. You know, when I look back, old folks say when I look back over my life, right, and I think things over. But seriously, um, in, in the midst of this pandemic, with evil around, with the phone calls and the text messages that that are coming our way, I honestly feel like I've been scotch guarded. I know it may sound weird, but I feel that there's a protective layer. And the only thing that I've been rehearsing is, and nothing by any means shall harm me. I, I believe in the sovereignty of God in the midst of severe pain that my family is feeling, that my friends are feeling because we've gotten the news of different people that have passed away that have been close to us, pre pastors that I've preached at their churches and all of us can have our own story. The only thing I know is that the God I serve is too wise to ever make a mistake. So I'm securing that, that if I'm in his hand, there is nothing outside of his will that can happen to me. And if it does, it still won't work for my good. Mm, mm, that's powerful. That's powerful. Good. Somebody else chime in on. What, is it, what does it mean to be in, in his hands? Let me jump in before y'all yeah, take it up a notch. Um, I think for me, it's um, kind of piggybacking off of literally the last um, words that Pastor Tate was saying. Um, I, uh, I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I think a lot of times we, we look at um, the scripture that says all things work together for good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. We look, we look at that scripture and we, we believe it as if it said all good things work together. Wow. And, you know, we have songs that say, you know, you know, my, you know I, I thank God because my good is outweighing the bad. And I've said it before, we have to realize that the scripture says all things work together for the good. And what that means is sometimes the good won't outweigh the bad, but at the end result of both, it'll be good. So mm -hmm. I could have 11 bad things in my life and only two good things in my life. But at the end of the day, once God finishes working those 11 and twos, it's going to all be good. So I, I think just in this day and age and, and the way that the world is going crazy and really um, just being kind of filled with fear not not necessarily just the church it's just it's a lot to deal with for anybody whether you're a believer or you're a non-believer and sure. having that mindset of knowing that whatever God is doing right now it's all going to be all right at the end of it all he's going to find some way to take this all and he's going to find some way to work it and really make it so that his people are straight um having that mindset it really kind of brings a sense of peace to your situation yes you can still be concerned for what's going on around you. Yes, you can still be concerned for your family and your loved ones. But it, for, for me personally, just knowing that, that no matter what happens, God is going to work this out for good. Even if, and this is the God's honest truth, it, it sounds a little morbid to say, but even if I don't make it personally, you know, I, I, I'm secure that I know that my final resting place is going to be with him. 
So even mm-hmm. if I don't make it, I know that all things work together for the good of them. That I, I understand that at the end of this all, it's all going to be good. Wow. Wow. Powerful. 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 Elder Dale, in his hands, what does it mean to you? In his hands to me means um, a strong level of community. Um, we, uh, I, I, I think I did this a few years ago on one of our services where I talked about, are we in good hands? And I just, me personally, I just don't believe we're in good hands. When we talk about our government, when you talk about, you know, the people that we have in charge, I don't believe we're in good hands, but us as a community of believers, like I find safety in uh, not only my own personal prayers over my family and over my loved ones, but in those who I'm in communion with, like my church community, my uh, I have people who are saved in California, people who are saved in Florida, like that community of believers, like those hands, those people who are praying. I, I have no doubt, I have no fear that we're going to be fine, even though within all of this, let's, let's be honest, there's been some tragedies within the body of Christ. There's been some um, deaths. There's been some people that we've lost. There's been, there are some people who are, that we know who are struggling with this right now, but none of that you know, even though I feel it, I'm saddened by it. None of that puts me in a place of alarm, like on my necks or my family. Like I really have a sense of comfort from that community, you know, the community of believers from, you know, you guys, from my church family, from all these people that I know that are praying, that are believing, and that we're going to come out of this, you know, on a, on a better note. But also with that, we, we talk about being in, we talk about hands, right? Bishop, you preach, you, you teach this so eloquently about the, 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 the gifts that Christ gave to the church, you know, the apostle, prophet, uh, pastors, evangelists, and teachers, right? That's one hand, but there's another hand with the bishops, the elders, the ministers, the deacons, the missionaries, right? Those hands that that he released his spirit into, all of those things, forget the title for a moment, it's a community because all of these, they function differently. You got gifts and you have administrations, right? On one side, you got gifts, you know, that demonstrate, I do this, but the other side, you have administration who keeps a balance on everything. So to me that I'm just big on imagery. I just see the imagery when he says into thy hands, I commend my, I commend my spirit is these hands, these gifts, these administrations wow. that wow. fix together as a community that gives people in a, in a hurting time where there's no leadership or lack thereof, this community can hold it together. Woo. This community can keep people afloat. This community can pray people out. This community can keep people sane because the physical health, we're talking mental health as well. This community is responsible for only not only maintaining our physical health, health, but our mental health as well. So I just, I feel safe and secure because I'm a part of this community that Christ left his hands into and my mental health is intact because of it. Yeah, yeah. That's really good. That's really good. Uh, Prophetess Mowbray, what does it mean to be in his hands? I want to say kudos to Prophetess Mowbray, everybody. She's feeling a little under the weather. Uh, she had a little sniffles and cough, but she chewed her way through tonight. And we really appreciate her for joining us because she was committed to being with us. And I really appreciate her and her contribution. I know you got a cough and a cold, but what does it mean to be in his hands? <laughs> thank you, Bishop. <clears throat> and thank everyone for their prayers and, and, um, there are text messages of um, encouragement and concern. Um, for me, being in God's hands, I feel like that scripture represents the, um, the interpersonal um, relationship that exists between God and my, mankind. You know, if you think about when a baby is born, that's one of the first things we do, right? When an infant is born, the first thing you do, you'll, you'll hold the baby in your arms it is your way of showing that this child is secure, right? That you're securing it. Um, it's one of the ways that we show our love and our affection. And for me, being into, being in God's hands, one represents a level of security that mm-hmm. we have, that I have as a believer during this time when I feel like a lot of church people feel obligated to know something, you know, like some people might speak to me and they'll say, oh, prophetess, like, did you see this? What do you sense? What do you know? And I'll say, I knew, I know nothing. (laughs) Um, I did not, 
<laughs> no, I did not foresee coronavirus, you know, coming and doing all the things that it's done. And I don't feel pressured to know. Mm -hmm. I know who knows, right? Ultimately, we know God, he knows. And it's, it's about a matter of trusting that experience that as a body of Christ, we may not know the ultimate outcome in terms of exactly how this thing will end, but we know who our trust should be in. Yes. So it's into those hands yeah. I command myself. I have security in that, not yeah. in which I know. So it's like being able to kind of leave your mind and go back into that childlike state that says, I can trust you. When we walk with our babies down the street, we, we lead the way, they hold our hands, right? And we guide them. Mm -hmm. It's like being able to say, God, we don't need to know every single answer, the in and the out, but because of who you are, we trust you as father that Amen. we can have rest and follow your lead wherever you take us. That's powerful. That's powerful. It's, the, it's whose hands I'm in. It's important. And I, you know, that that's really, really good. Looking to him as father, because as we noted before, we said, my God, my God, but this time again, he says father. And yes. so being in the hands of the father is so secure and it's so powerful. That's real good. Pastor Chanel, bring us in. What, what does it mean being in these hands? I think I really don't have much to contribute to that statement because everybody that has gone before me has said such amazing things. And so I'm just sitting here in awe and just receiving just that understanding of how to rest in the father's hands. So I think that they did a sufficient job on expounding on that one statement. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sufficient being in the father's hands. Very good. I pray you were blessed tonight. Thank you so very much. Everybody on Facebook Live, do me a favor, give all of our conversationalists a big hand. They did a fabulous job, remarkable job at this conversation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I think it was helpful. I like this dialogue. Um, I believe that people got a lot of insight and they felt the reality of Jesus and not just a preachment moment where, you know, we create this other image. I want you to do me a favor, those of you on Facebook Live, I want you to sow into this moment. I do believe that we grow into what we seed into. And I believe that this is still a moment that you can seed uh, here at Crown Ministries, the Royal Worship Center. We know the value of seeding and sowing and we understand it. Uh, and even in times like this, uh, we seed and we sow because we know that there is an expiration date on being quarantined. There's an expiration date on this, this pandemic. And when it's all over, we need a harvest. <laughs> on the other side of the pandemic, you're gonna need a harvest. And so it's important and imperative that you see it and so into this. So those of you who are on Facebook Live, right on the bottom of the screen, there is pinned there uh, a link. I want you to sow into that link uh, and, and click on that link, or you can text to give. You can simply text CMI to the number 28950. It's right there on the bottom of your screen, one of the comments that's pinned there. Just click on that or just sew it together. And I'm gonna challenge every person that's on. If every one of you would do this, we'll be doing real good tonight. If everybody would sow a seed of $20, that's it, just $20. You can text it, you can give it online. Go to our website even at www.crown-ministries.org. Check us out. But for your convenience, it's right there. And uh, I want you to simply click on that and give and sow and complete that contribution. And we thank you for your generosity. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for giving and we thank you for sowing here in the Crown Ministries. Uh, and and I, I thank God for this conversation tonight. It was a great, powerful conversation. Again, to all of our conversationalists, they did a fabulous job. Jesus finally hangs his, hangs his head on the locks of his shoulders. He gives up the ghost. And Jesus dies right before the Passover begins. Joseph of Arimathea, a town in the city, a village close by, came and took Jesus' body off the cross, put him into his own grave and his own tomb, rolled the stone in front of it. And Jesus laid there and Jesus was dead. You can imagine the scene. You can imagine the thoughts, the psyche of the disciples, that their master, their savior, their hero, their teacher, their rabbi is gone. He's dead. 
It could be how some churches are feeling right now. Their pastor, their bishop, their apostle is not here. You can only imagine the thoughts, the agony, the pain that they're experiencing right now. The only difference is with Jesus on Sunday morning. Matter of fact, early on Sunday morning, he gets up. So I want you to think about that. I want you to continue to stay safe, stay sanitized, uh, continue to take care of yourself and your family. If you know any pastors that's out there, I want you to share an opportunity for pastors that I'm making available on tomorrow. On tomorrow at 5 p.m. Saturday, April the 11th at 5 p.m., I'm offering a special webinar just for pastors, a special webinar just for pastors to talk about strength and strategy during this time and what to do beyond this time. Because when this is all over, we're gonna to need to know what to do. And the church needs to be the leading voice as to where we should go from here. I want all the senior pastors to join me for that webinar tomorrow. Simply, easily register for free by going to unchurches.org. That's unchurches.org. They're gonna be putting that into the comments now for you. And you can simply click on that link, that website link, and you can register for free. Tell all the senior pastors you know, if they're looking for help, if they're looking for resources, if they're looking to figure out what to do in times and seasons like this, they need to be on this webinar tomorrow. I'm looking to help as many pastors as possible to get through this. Thank you again for joining us. I want to also open the arms of Christ. If there's anybody on Facebook Live tonight that does not know Jesus, the Jesus we talked about, the Jesus we just had a conversation about, the Jesus who died on the cross but rose again on the third day, you can be saved tonight. You don't have to wait for Sunday. You don't have to wait for Saturday. You can be saved on a good Friday night during a quarantine. If you don't know him, it's a good Friday for you. You can confess him. It's very easy. How do you do that, Pastor? So we're not in the church. Yes, we are, because we are the church. And the church is opening up her arms to you and offer you an extension to come to Jesus Christ. The Bible makes it very clear. If we just confess with our mouth, the Lord Jesus, if we just believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we're saved. It's just that easy. If you wanna be saved today, I don't care how old you are, I don't care what you've done in your past, I wanna make Jesus available for you right now. Simply declare, I wanna be saved. Simply write that in the comments on Facebook Live. I want to be saved. I want, maybe you do a raising hand emoji, and <laughs> just simply declare, I want to be saved. It's an opportunity for you to come to Jesus. Maybe somebody's out there, you're in a backslidden state, and honestly, Corona has scared the wits out of you, and you know it's ready, it's time for you to come back to Jesus. You've been saying, I'm going to do it, you've been saying, I'm coming next Sunday, and next Sunday never came, but now it's a good Friday. Backslider, come back to Christ. He loves you so much that the Bible says he's married to you. You may have left him, but he didn't leave you. He's still with you, and he wants you to come on home. Right there on your computer, your iPad, your cell phone, you can come to Christ. I want to come back to Christ. If that's you, make that comment. Do a raise a hand emoji, and we want to bring you back to Christ. And do me a favor. Repeat this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Come into my heart. Save me. Change me, transform me. I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus. I believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead. I am no longer my own. I now belong to you. I do not belong to this world. I am yours, Lord. And I confess that I am saved. I am saved. I am saved. Well, congratulations. If you said that for the first time or you said it again and meant it from the bottom of your heart, you're saved. You're part of this great family, that community that Elder Dale was talking about. You're now a part of that. And we welcome you as our brother and our sister. We want you to write your name in the comments and say, I got saved tonight because we want to follow up with you. We want to send you emails. We want to send you information. We want to give you stuff that's going to help you in this walk and this journey of salvation. It's going to be a journey now. It ain't gonna always be easy, but it is possible because Jesus Christ is now your Lord and your Savior. 
We so appreciate you. We so honor you and we so love you. And we're glad that you made this life changing decision. We're getting ready to go. But before we go, I'm gonna ask Pastor Chanel, would you just pray us out and uh, do a concluding prayer for us? And we're just gonna leave in prayer. Thank you for all of you on Facebook Live. Thank you for all of you that have joined us tonight. We appreciate you and we honor you, we love you. Thank you for joining the Royal Worship Center. Pastor Chanel, pray us out tonight. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we just thank you, Father, for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come before your presence. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us to have a conversation around one of the most crucial moments in your life that changed history and changed our future. So, God, we just thank you for the cross. We thank you for the work of the cross. We thank you, God, that it was in that moment that you cried out, it is finished. So tonight we celebrate the finished work of the cross. We celebrate the finished work of Christ, knowing that what you did you died once and for all all eternity all time you did it once and for all all of humanity was in you on that cross and tonight we just worship you for such a sacrifice we thank you that you made a sacrifice just for us and lord we honor you for that in this moment we thank you that we can have these conversations and exchange these ideas and and walk into a greater understanding of the work that you did on the cross and so tonight even as we close out this time we thank you for the work that you did we thank you for the exchange we thank you god that it was because of your wounds you said you were wounded for our transgressions you were bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon you but with your stripes we are healed so god we thank you for the healing that came through the cross we thank you for the salvation god we thank you for the deliverance and the breakthrough so right now in the name of the lord jesus we decree and declare heaven come and to the life of every viewer, every person a part of this, this, uh, this forum that's been a part of this conversation, we pray heaven come. Not our will, but your will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven, God. Those that are grieving tonight, those that are hurting tonight, those that are looking for clarity tonight, we decree and declare that it is now time for their breakthrough. It is now time for the chief, the chief to come into their life and begin to reveal his divine plan. God, even help us, Lord, to be like you did were in the Garden of Gethsemane. Help us to cry out, not our will, but thy will be done. Even in the midst of this quarantine, help us to submit and surrender like you did to the cross. Help us to bear our cross each and every single day. Lord God, we thank you for every viewer. We thank you for every participant. And we say, Father, your will be done. Even as we close out this session, we are believing you for miracles. We are believing you for signs. We are believing you for wonders. We are looking for the breakthrough. Even now, we thank you for it, God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. 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 To God be the glory. Thank you so very much. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. Again, stay safe. Stay clean. Stay sanitized. And may the Lord be with you. You have a great rest tonight. And we'll see you on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. The Royal Worship Center as we celebrate the resurrected Christ. God bless you and bye-bye for now.